Today, I'm joined by Jane Werwind, the incredible founder behind one of the world's best known skincare brands, Dermalogica. Launching the brand over 30 years ago, Jane has truly shaped our perspectives on skincare, beauty brands, and the industry as a whole. Tune in for more on this. Hi everyone and welcome to Founded Beauty, a podcast dedicated to beauty entrepreneurs who built some of the biggest brands today and where we learn exactly how they did it. We'll cover some of the most intimate stories, their path to success and how they overcame the obstacles along the way. I'm Akash Mehta, CEO and co-founder of Fable and Main, a modern hair wellness brand inspired by ancient Indian beauty secrets. Building Fable and Main has been an incredible journey so far and I decided to launch this podcast as a founder keen to learn and connect with fellow beauty brand founders around the world. I believe in collaboration over competition, so I'm using this platform as a way to hopefully help and inspire each other what can be quite a tough and lonely journey. So if you are an entrepreneur or simply just curious how to build a brand, this podcast is perfect for you. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Jane Werwind. She is the co-founder of the leading global skincare brand, Dermalogica, launched the brand in 1986 alongside her husband, Raymond. After training in skin therapy and receiving student requests for product recommendations, Jane created a skincare range that would go on to shape the category as we know it. Dermalogica was one of the industry's first cosmetic and pharmaceutical hybrids formulating without irritants for skincare solutions. And today, Jane is one of the most respected authorities in professional skin therapy and is highly esteemed for her work with FITE, an initiative she launched to help young women set up their own businesses. From advising the UN Foundation's Global Entrepreneurs Council to being appointed a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship by President Barack Obama, Jane is an absolute powerhouse. And it's truly such an honor to sit down with her today. So Jane, thank, thank you for you being so with us. Thank you so much, Akash. I'm so excited. And I, where were you in 1986 when we were starting Dermalogica? I would have loved to have had the opportunity to listen to the stories of other founders and how they did it. That, I think, would have been so reassuring to me that I wasn't completely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and not alone as well, right? Because I, I can imagine... Uh, especially back then being the at the forefront of something yeah. so pioneering when there wasn't many brands out there let alone in skin but yeah. especially in your space um there are moments where you're like like am i is it is this possible yeah. like should i be doing this um but you know thank god <laughs> you know this is why i have the podcast today is because yeah. the story is like yours so that's why I'm, I'm so grateful but so jane i i start my podcast asking the question to everyone and I'm really curious to see your response. It's, it's sort of like an open-ended but very tough question. Uh, who, in a nutshell, is Jane? That oh, is the question. <laughs> Jane is fearless, vulnerable, huge David Bowie fan, um, youngest of four Ooh. sisters, mother of two children, um, curious, seeking, um, big baby energy and excited. <laughs> I love that. What a beautiful, I mean, that's going to be like a lot of pillars that I think will shape the podcast perfectly. Cause I'm excited to get into sort of a bunch of those different facets. Uh, I guess starting at uh, talking about the kind of, that kind of kid baby energy, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Um, and I know we, you're born in Edinburgh yeah, and raised exactly. in the UK. Is that born in of, Edinburgh. Was, yeah. <clears throat> and then when I was nine years old, my mum, uh, then widowed, moved um, the family down to the south of England to Poole in Dorset um, because she wanted to be near her parents. Uh, her father was suffering from Parkinson's. My mother was a nurse mm -hmm. and she wanted to nurse him for his final years. And she did. And so I was born and raised in Edinburgh and then moved to the south of England. Oh, my, but my best friend is from Poole, so I've been there quite a few times. I went <laughs> surfing and I know the area inside out. So uh, <laughs> that's that's such a coincidence. But um, it, yeah, I, I can imagine that kind of um, south of England, uh, you must have had like a lot of influencers of like, like you know, being able to have the coastal uh, environment, but then obviously maybe day trips into London if you come exactly on the or something. yeah but me and my friend that's... my friend and, and I should say Jane whose name is also Jane and still one of my besties yeah. we used to take the train from Poole up to London and get back within a day on a cheap day yeah. ticket and probably didn't tell our parents 
<laughs> and then they would never know. They were like, how was the day by the beach? Exactly, like, yeah, it's great, it's great. exactly. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love that. And, and I, I mean, one thing I remember reading about was, I think one of your first jobs was in a hair salon at a very young age. Yeah. Um, and was that like one of your first, I guess, experiences or memories into beauty or you know, did it come a bit before you know, that? It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting. My mum used to always say, I don't know where you get this from, but uh, because my mum is very practical. She was widowed at age 38. Mm. Um, my dad died suddenly when I was two years old. So my mum had a lot on her hands with four kids to raise on her own as a nurse. And she hadn't worked since she um, had been married because then the, the the laws were and were until the 1960s. That if you were married, if you got married as a nurse, you gave up your job to a single person. It was the same in teaching. So you kind of you left mm. your work. So my mum hadn't worked, had to suddenly go back to work. And so very practical, as you can imagine. And I would get pocket money when, when we moved to England. I don't remember getting it in Scotland, but when we got to England, I got a tiny bit of pocket money every week. And I used to buy a little sachet of what's, what was then a face mask called yeast pack. Now, I don't ask me how or why I decided this was my miracle product for some reason, but I would buy it from the chemist. And I would cut open this sachet on a Saturday. I got my allowance on a Saturday. And I'd squeeze out a third and I would apply a third to my face. And over the week, I would apply, like every other day, a third of that face mask. And then and next Saturday, I would spend all my allowance on one sachet of this yeast pack. And so that was my first inkling of anything to do with skincare. And then my Auntie Anne gave me a tube of Avon Pretty Peach hand cream when I was about nine. And that was a huge thing. Let me tell you, Akash, because it had a peach, a plastic peach top. So it was incredibly sort of chic as far as I was concerned. And so with this yeast pack and my hand cream, I felt completely, you know, super fantastically protected and, and cared for. And then at age 13, as you said, I walked in to the local hair salon in Broadstone, which is a little village yeah. outside of Poole. And I walked into the local hair salon, which only just closed about four years ago. It was Mark Young on Ooh. the Broadway Broadstone. Shout out to all of you yeah. who might be listening from there. And um, I asked them if they had a job for someone working on a Saturday. And, and they employed me illegally <laughs> for the first two years yeah. until I was 15 yeah. and a half. And uh, my job was doing yeah. the laundry and staying out of sight and then cleaning up the salon when everyone had left. And I loved it. I fell in love with the industry in that salon. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, and, and then I, I, I was also doing more research and I saw like, you know, ahead of the launch, there was quite a few experiences you had about um, uh, also in hair and skin, but like with red cane and stuff. So oh, yeah. could you paint us that picture until obviously Dermalogica was created? Like, what was that kind of years like? Yeah, so I have always been in this industry. I've, I, I always like, I like to step forward and say, I don't have a college degree. I never went to university. And despite that fact, I'm I'm actually on two uh, major boards at the University of California, Los Angeles. I keep wondering, it's the medical board and the business board, and I keep wondering if they actually think I made, I'm sort of teasing them, but I didn't. I went, to, I went to study skincare. So 13, I got my job in the hair salon. When I was 16, uh, I was 15 and a half, I was promoted to shampoo girl. That was my official title. And I could be seen by clients because I was now legally old enough to work a full day. When I was 16, um, they hired a skin therapist. It was then called a beauty therapist. I just don't use that term to describe our work at Dermalogica because we are that hybrid between a pharmaceutical and a cosmetic. And um, when she joined and I saw what she did, I thought, okay, I thought I wanted to be a hairdresser. I definitely want to be what this person does. So when I left high school, I went straight to study skincare at the Royal Bath Hotel, had a a training center um, in Bournemouth. And I did my training and then my apprenticeship was in the salon where I was working. And my first job after I qualified was working as a makeup artist because I'd done makeup, nails, massage, skin, we did the whole thing. And I worked for Mary Quant for two years, and I was a makeup artist on her promotional team, which, let me tell you, was pretty cool. The coolest thing was, other than I was working for Mary Quant, was the uniform, which was 
unbelievably fabulous. And if, I'm so sorry I didn't keep one piece of it. Yeah. Anyway, after yeah. Mary Quant, um, I emigrated. It was the 70s. I, I wanted to leave the UK. I wanted to travel. I'm curious. I'm a seeker. My mum said, go. I traveled. I emigrated. There were three countries that you kind of emigrated to from Britain at that time. It was Canada, South Africa, and Australia, because they all offered yeah. assisted passage, which was basically 40 pounds. And as long as you stayed for two years, they paid your ticket, the government. So Canada was too cold. Australia seemed too far. Geography was not my strong suit in school, by the way. So I thought it was a January and I thought, oh, well, I'm going to go to South Africa because it's summer there and it will be hot, which it was. Yeah. And off I went. And yeah. when I got to South Africa, I worked in salons to begin with. I did my teaching credential while I was living there in that first year. And then I got a job with Redken, who were launching their skincare line in South Africa. And I had the privilege of helping them launch it. And so that became my link to the States because Redken was then privately owned by Paula Kent Meehan and Jerry Redding. Yep. And um, they were based in Los Angeles. So I became a trainer for them and I got a trip to LA to come out for some advanced training work. And of course, once I came to Los Angeles, it was uh, sort of all over. Loved it. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, that's so exciting. So, I mean, then I think that's a perfect segue, I guess, into sort of from arriving in LA. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that then there was this whole, I guess, Dermalogica story that was born, uh, I think, starting with the Dermal Institute and yeah. then, yeah, the actual <clears throat> brand. Yeah. So take it away. The floor is yours because it's such a beautiful story. So when I came to Los Angeles, um, I was dating Raymond then. We, we've now been married for over 30 years, but we were dating. He was in Los Angeles. I knew him from South Africa. In fact, he'd run the division for Redken in South Africa. And he had also made the decision he was going to emigrate. But we emigrated separately and we ended up in, in Los Angeles together. And because we dated before, you know, we kind of picked it all up again. And uh, I decided, well, I'm going to get a job because... The cool thing when you have a skill set of any nature, I don't, you know, I'm a skin therapist, but you could be a hairdresser, you could be a patisserie, you could be a butcher, a plumber, yeah. an electrician. You can always work. You will always be able to get work because you literally are traveling with this skill set in your head mm -hmm. and, in, and hopefully in your heart and in your hands. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to come to LA and I'll get a job in a salon. And I mean, I, my imagination was there must be tons of salons in LA because there were tons in London that do skincare. But when I got here, that was not true. And in fact, if I'd done even the tiniest bit of research, I would have learned before I came here that only seven out of the 50 states in the USA even had a qualification to be any kind of skincare therapist or esthetician or cosmetician or different names it was given at that time. And so I realized it was not as entrenched an industry as I had imagined. Hair was huge and everywhere, but skincare was not. Nails were just bubbling up, but not as huge as they are now. So what I realized as I went on interviews, and all the salons were in Beverly Hills, and all the salons were owned by European older women, Aida Gray, Aida Tibion, Georgette Klinger, Christine Valmay. Those were the names, and they named the salons after themselves. So I went for an interview, and because I did have a good training, and I had got my teaching credential, and, and you know, and I was 25 years old and, and looked, you know, yeah. like I was in the industry then, they offered me a job. And when I said to them, how, why is it you're, you're only employing European-trained skin therapists, because I've sort of seen people, but you've got American – women and people answering the phones. And it was Aida Tibiant mm. who said to me, well, it's really easy, Jane. Europeans don't know how to sell and the Americans don't know how to give a skincare treatment. And it was such a flip comment, yeah. but I thought yeah. to myself, what does, that, what does that mean? What's the training like? I had no awareness of this. And what I found out was the training in California where there was such a qualification was only 600 hours, four months. Whereas the training in the rest of the world and in the UK, which is still very strong, was sort of two years with a one-year apprenticeship. And now wow. in, Austra for, in Australia and South Africa, for example, it can be a four-year training. And that last year is a university 
piece, which gives you a degree uh, in this industry. So the whole industry has changed completely. But then it was nascent. And in America, I realized, well, the big opportunity is not working in a salon for one of these women, although that would be great. I could do that. Yeah. That will be my fallback plan. But the opportunity must be to open some kind of training center to train the people who do have this 600-hour license to be more efficient and more effective and build a better clientele and have a career that literally helps them pay the rent. Because with that level of training, 600 hours just wasn't enough to be successful. And so that's what I did. And I, I rented a thousand square feet office next to the social security office in Marina Del Rey, where I was living in a one bedroom apartment. And it was the cheapest rent because I guess no one wanted to be next to the social security office. It was fine for me. And we opened up this small training center and I, it sounds so ridiculous because it sounds so sort of amateurish, but this is sort of what you do. You figure it out as you're going along. You don't know what to do. 100%. So you just kind of figure it out. Nah. So I thought, well, I've got to write to people and tell them I'm doing this training. How am I going to find out who does have a license? So I knew because nah. I'd done my qualification in California by then, there was a state board which issued the license. So I called them up in Sacramento, spoke to a lovely woman on the phone. And I said, do you perhaps have a list of everyone with their addresses who's qualified to do skincare, you know, the 600 hours? And she said, mm -hmm. yes. And I said, wow. And can I ask you a question? Would, do you sell that list or can I get that list? And she said, oh, I don't know. I've never been asked that. Can I call you back tomorrow? And I said, yes. Now, this is before the internet, remember. You can't Google anything. There was yeah. no Google anything. So she, she called me back the next day. I still got the letter she then followed up with. Her name was Delphine Cathcart. I mean, this is crazy that okay. I remember this nonsense. Uh, but anyway, she called me back that. and she said, I found out, yes, we can sell you the list. I said, how much is it? She said, $25. And I said, oh, I'll definitely have that then. Thank you, Delphine. Yeah. And she said, would you like me to send it pre-printed on white Avery labels? So I could just stick it on a postcard. So I said, yes, that would be great. So the list arrived. I faithfully hand copied every single address onto little recipe cards. So I had everyone's address. Wow. And then I used those white labels to send out a postcard saying, hello, this is who I am. And I'm offering training and come to a free one day orientation. I don't know. I was hoping I would get, I don't know, like 15 people. And I got 70 uh, responses within the first couple of days. And I knew then the demand wow. is huge. Yeah. So that was training. And as you said earlier, yeah. that was three years before Dermalogica. Yeah. Oh my God. So that's, and then, so what was some of the key lessons and learnings during those three years? And then eventually that seed was then eventually planted to a product-based business. Yeah, it's really interesting, Akash, because now I think about it, what I was doing was mm. actually building a community. But that word wasn't really used then. But when I, now when I look at social media, for example, it's exactly what's yeah. happening. You build a following, you build a community, yeah. and people follow you. So the, the, the message is exactly the same. But the plumbing is different. The plumbing then was really laborious because you had to find people and literally word of mouth meant you had to find somebody and actually speak to them. But in doing yeah. that, you were making a very strong human connection and, and actually mm. much stronger than I would say social media because you really did know that person. So, so what happened mm. was I would bring people into the school and we would, I would teach them. And okay, so ostensibly, I am upskilling them. I'm teaching them. Oh, the, the, honestly, the training was so weak. I would say, okay, so let's talk about, you know, allopoid dehydrated skin, which is a skin lacking oil, right? Not a skin lacking water, which would be dehydrated mm -hmm. and allopoid is lacking oil. And my students would just stare at me <laughs> and say, yeah. well, there's dry, normal, sensitive, oily, and combination skin, right? And I'd say, uh, oh, well, that's 
those are consumer terms that we don't use those yeah. terms. So I said, okay, all right, stop, stop everything. Before we talk about allopoid skin, let's talk about skin histology. Let's understand exactly how the skin works so we can all have a basis. So it became this conversation of education. And I'm mm. very enthusiastic. So, you know, I would say, now you're all going to work on each other. I'm going to help you. No panicking allowed. I made everyone take down their nails. Most people were wearing acrylics. I said, it's got to come off. They said, no, I can't take them off. And I said, you've got to remove them because you're going to be learning techniques where you're going to be touching the face with your hands. Yeah. And some of the movements require you to move your hands. And therefore, if you've got long fingernails, you're going to scratch the client's skin. It's not acceptable and yeah. it's not hygienic. So in all of this, we were teaching higher standards, better sanitation, pride of ownership of your work and the students were connecting and bonding with each other they were not alone they were not just working in a room at the back of a hair salon somewhere they had a place they had a tribe as they said to me we are like a family i said you're my family here in the states and they answered me no we're like a yeah. tribe and i said great and they had a, a uh -huh. chorus when uh, we launched dermalogica they would say they we bleed gray our packaging was always gray and white. And it was just unbelievably mm. solid support. And many of them had their whole careers with us. I've now lived long enough yeah. to see them retire. And we have incredible memories. And they were our influencers, if you want to say that, because they yeah. were the ones that went yeah. back to the salons they were working in and said, look at me, I can wax a bikini line in seven minutes. So none of them could even wax yeah. half a leg. And so they became yeah. influencers. Many of them became teachers. Many of them became our teachers. And so yeah. what was happening over those three years, Akash, was rather like building a super powerful, strong social media presence. And then yeah. we introduced Dermalogica based on all the things I'd learned in those three years. They wanted formulas that we would now say were clean. They wanted no lanolin, yeah. no fragrance, no mineral oil, no artificial color. Why do you need artificial color and artificial fragrance in a product? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Why do you care if your moisturizer is pink, blue, or yellow? Don't you just want whatever color it is? Yes. So but that was all new. That was all different. We had no jars because mm. jars are disgusting. You put your fingers in them and it's completely contaminated very quickly, unless you're using high levels of preservatives, which we were not. Yeah. So we had no. tubes and we had uh, pumps and we, it was all very original. We didn't have a toner that you went on with cotton wool. We had a spray toner. Multi-active toner was the first spray on toner. Mm. And we everything was sort of, you know, couldn't be touched because it was all very quasi-pharmaceutical. So the name derma, skin, yeah. Latin for skin, and using Latin because it was the word of the language of pharmaceuticals and medicine. Derma, yeah. logica. Logica means logical, sensible, makes sense. Yeah. Derma logica. And I, d I just hope, I, I wrote a book over COVID called Skin in the Game, which is this story mm. and the story of Derma logica. And in it, I talk about this first trade show we did in January of 1986. And we just hoped that yeah. we would open 10 accounts because we had a $1,500 opening order and I needed $15,000 to pay the contract manufacturer to make our formulas because we owned the formulas. And that's a whole story too. Yeah. And I was praying we'd open 10 accounts over the three days of the trade show at $1,500 a pop. That was a lot. And we opened yeah. 10 accounts in the first three hours. And Dermalogica wow. did a million dollar turnover its first year. Yeah, that is incredible. I actually like I, I tend to like um, do two, th two, two things at the same time. So I've literally just while you're talking, mm -hmm. ordered your book on Amazon. So I'm excited to <laughs> read it. Uh, <laughs> Skin in the game. Everything you need is already inside you. Yeah. I love it. It's amazing. So uh, that's going to be my read when I get it probably next day because Amazon is so good that way. Thanks, thanks, um, so I'm excited to, to I mean, I'm, I'm probably like it's like a you know, it's like when you I get a synthesis now and then yeah. I get a really in detailed, rich uh, kind of storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. And then one day I want a, a, a film about your life and then I'll have another medium to okay, watch. Okay, so let's do it. That's my next Listen. request. Yeah, you should Anyth do that'd anything's be amazing. possible, right? Anything's possible. <laughs> exactly. Anything is possible. Yeah. Well, I mean, so you mentioned, you know, Demologica, love the name inspiration. I would, you know, 
really love to know a little bit about the initial MPD and obviously then a little bit about where we are today because there's been many years of incredible um, product development, but yeah. that beginning days, what did you guys launch with? Okay, so this was this was also a very interesting story. And again, we were too mm. we were sort of too naive not to do it. You see, when mm. when you don't understand the risk, you'll take it, right? We were very very buoyed by this response from our students, and they kept saying to me every class. And I was teaching lymph drainage, reflexology, aromatherapy, um, skincare techniques, obviously waxing, massage, Ayurvedic treatments, and acupuncture, acupressure. Wow. I brought outside teachers in. You name it. If you could do it to a human being, we probably were doing it. So. The students were so excited about all this new information. And, and I wrote really comprehensive workbooks because, again, this is r right at the point of technology being developed. We got one of the very first IBM computers. And the reason we bought IBM and not an Apple computer was because Apple wasn't quite ready. It didn't, ha it didn't have the Mac or mm. anything like that before Windows. We're talking prehistoric times. So I was getting all this feedback from the students saying, Jane, Jane, when when can we get a product? You, why don't you make a product? And I kept saying, no, 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 we're an educational training center. It's not about, I mean, well, how, how the hell am I going to make a product? Contrary to popular myth, entrepreneurs generally don't make product in their own bathtub and sort of fill it themselves in the kitchen. That's that's ridiculous. I mean, I just find that astonishingly crazy. So yeah. I knew if I was going to make a product, I'd had enough experience with Mary Quant and Redkin to know that it had to be made properly and I wasn't a chemist. So I kept saying, well, you know, there are other products you could use. Surely, what are you using now? And they would tell me names of products, Dr. Babur, Reni Gino, Jean Gatineau, um, that were all very well-respected products in Europe, but were then not made in the United States. And I said, well, how are you getting those products from Europe? They were paying import duties and customs and taxes. It was really mm. expensive. And, and here was the kicker, they were not retailing that product to their customers because it was too expensive to carry stock. So yeah. what they were doing is they were learning these techniques to offer skincare treatments in the treatment room, but they were not retailing products. That was really sort of unheard of in a salon. Mm. So the only thing that salons sold were hair products and sort of umbrellas and rain bonnets and hairspray. You know, it wasn't, it was nothing like we think now. So I said to them, because Red can have been a retailed line as well as a professional line, I said, but why? And I'd had my experience from Mary Quant where we would sell 20,000 pounds in a week at Harrods. And I'd say, yeah. what, what are you, what, why are you doing that? Why aren't we, what American product can we use that we wouldn't pay import? There were none. Yeah. There were none. I mean, get that wow. cash. I kept thinking they must be out there and I just don't know about them. Because again, you couldn't Google American skincare products. You just had to wait for someone to show it to you or tell you about it. So what happened was we just, we made a decision. We're going to, we're going to do a skincare line. And it, we made the decision because we realized that the educational business model was terrific and important, but ultimately mm. it was based on an ongoing education of the same group of people. And then as more people joined the industry, we would be building the industry, which we still train people. We train over a hundred thousand skin therapists a year now still. So we have a huge yeah. training and education arm. But what we realized was these students will not be as successful as they could be if they do not mm. have a product that will really blow the socks off anything else. And a product designed for a professional treatment, which is very different than something you design for a consumer. Because a professional cleanser, for example, mm. You're putting on a cleanser twice. We invented the double cleanse. That, that was absolutely an international dermal institute concept, and it came into Dermalogica. So we were teaching double cleansing under steam in a salon. Well, that means mm. the cleanser is in contact with the skin for at least 10 minutes, five minutes for each cleanse because it comes with a massage under steam. If you're massaging a cleanser under steam and, and heat friction with massage, you better have a product that is very well tolerated by all skin conditions. It's not on and off in 30 seconds like in your bathroom. So we were developing products for use in the professional treatment, which were going to get real results because otherwise that client wouldn't come back and have another treatment. 
We were teaching nope. extraction techniques. We were teaching how to apply a mask with the brush. We're not going to put it on with our fingertips like I did with my little yeast pack when I was nine years old. So we were teaching all these professional techniques, and we wanted those skin therapists to go out and share them with clients. So when, when we got fired up with this idea of let's, let's create a product, because that's actually what our business model will be, we mm. realized that if these skin therapists are unleashed – and can sell product to the clients that's professional for them to recommend, then they will increase their their profit profitability in their businesses by at least 50%. 50% of their revenue will come from product sales. That inspired me because I knew what these of skin therapists were earning and making. And I knew that many of them could never afford to own their own salon. They were working in the back of a hair salon because they weren't profitable enough. Mm. So now I'm completely lit up about we're going to make a product that makes them more successful. And it's going to be the best darn product I can come up with. I sat and I briefed out, I wrote out this dreamscape of products. I want a foaming cleanser that removes all eye makeup and does not sting the eyes. That was special cleansing gel, still one of our yeah. top five products. I want a spray on toner because I don't want the waste of cotton balls in a trash can full of product and going into the waste when we could just be spraying the toner on and saving the cotton wool, saving saving the, the energy and also preserving the product. So I wrote out yeah. a dreamscape, which no one had, and I want no mineral oil, no lanolin, blah, blah, blah. And I took this dreamscape. Kind of, I think of it like the script of Dermalogica, like a film script. And I pitched it to chemists. Could you make this for us? And how did I find chemists? I went to the library and I pulled out one of the reference books of the Society of Cosmetic Chemists. And I found every chemist in Southern California that had a phone number, no email, remember, a phone number, no cell phones, remember, uh, or an address. And I either wrote or called 70 of them. Within what I found out was the zip code sitting in that library, the zip code that we could, you know, at least work together. And I was in LA, so it was a lot. And I called, contacted each and every one of them, gave them the brief, not as detailed as I had it, because I didn't want them to pitch my idea. But I told them we're looking for a freelance cosmetic chemist to develop the formulas because one lesson one, and this is to share everyone who's thinking of starting their own line, own your formulas. Anyone can go to a mm. private label house and get that cleanser with their own label on it. You have nothing to sell because when it comes to an acquisition, the first question that you're going to be asked is, do you own your formulas? Because if you don't own your formulas, mm. then what you own is your marketing. And someone else could probably yeah. do that. So lesson That's number one, we really wanted to own our formulas. So we, out of the 70, most of them wouldn't even respond. Some of them responded and said, the no mineral oil, no lanolin, no, that, that was impossible. They couldn't, you couldn't do it. You had to preserve it with something. And if you weren't using formaldehyde as a preservative, which we did not, you were going to have to use mineral oil, which is inert and stable. I wanted to use vegetable oils, which they said would easily contaminate and you couldn't preserve them without using. So it was this circle of being told that can't be done. And I just wouldn't give up until all 70 had told me it couldn't be done. And then I would go on to the next 70. I was just feral. I get obsessed with something yeah. and I dive down that rabbit hole hard. Came down to, the, to three people, three chemists that said they could make it. Yeah. Two of them were too expensive. They wanted $10,000 a formula, which was nothing yeah. now, huge then. And we didn't have any money. I had, we had $14,000 of self-funding. That was it. Raymond came up with a brilliant um, construct, which I outline in the book, with the chemist that ultimately yeah. did develop the formulas for us, where we would pay him a percentage of uh, ingredients to manufacture the product. It's, it's all laid out in the book. It's a bit complicated, but it's so clever. It's so simple and so clever. He agreed to do that. He would be paid over a two-year period of the product that we made. We knew that if we weren't successful, we wouldn't be making any product and he wouldn't be getting any money. And if we were outrageously mm -hmm. successful, he would make more than 10,000 a formula. The good and bad news was, Akash, and you read this in the book, a month before we launched at that trade show, that chemist holding the formulas 
not released to us yet. We would get the formulas released to us after we paid him off after two years. He came to us the month before and said that he wanted to buy a new car, needed money, and he wanted us to buy the formulas now. And if we didn't, he was walking. We had wow. no money to buy the formulas. Oh my gosh. We figured it out. We figured it out. We got the formulas. He left happy. That's a whole other story of how we did that. That is also in the book because it's yeah. a longer story. We didn't even have a credit card. I'm excited about that. So uh, we did manage it. The formulas were successful. We owned them. Thank goodness it was the best thing that probably ever happened to us. That chemist walked and we got to own the formulas. And we launched with 27 formulas right out the gate. $1,500 wow. opening order, 27 formulas. Nine were professional only to use in the treatment room, and the rest were retail. So now my students had retail mm -hmm. cleansers, toner, two moisturizers, three boosters, two serums, by the way, which no one was using that word in skincare. Everyone kept saying, what is a booster? What is a serum? And I kept explaining it's an accelerator wow. and a mixer. We had a botanical mixer. We had 27 and I list the OG, I call them the OGs, the OG Dermalogica products in, in the book because they're my children. And from that, we grew Dermalogica and it was the right product with the right message at the right time. And I learned that because of working every single day with my target market, which was the skin therapist. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think it's such a great, great advice for anyone starting a company or even if you've started it, like you can do a tech transfer of your, you know, the, the formula, just try to own it as quick as you can. Um, yes. Because the bigger you get, the more harder and more expensive it 100%, is. 100%. And you've maybe got, even yeah. unlikely. You know? yeah. yeah, you've got to, to pre-negotiate that buyout with the chemist or with the contract yeah. manufacturer ahead of time. We decided to go with an independent chemist and a separate contract manufacturer simply because we had experience in the industry. And we knew mm. that if the contract manufacturer owns the formulas as well as making the product, you are held hostage by or you could be held yeah. hostage by the, them the, for how much the, they're going to charge you to make the product. Exactly. And they'll so rarely use, relinquish it um, and, correct. And, uh, unless you have an amazing deal. Yeah. Correct. So you, I would always recommend separate chemists to the separate contract manufacturer. If you own your formulas, you can shop those formulas around between other cos weather yeah. contract manufacturers. And the, uh, the third thing is, which is vital, margin. You must it's, I've seen the most beautiful products developed and I've been shown them and I've mentored people who uh, I, I'm at the um, Anderson School of Business at UCLA and the MBA students there will show me products that they are developing. And the first thing I say is, what is your margin? And it's different in every industry. Mm. The margin in food, for example, could be 2%. I don't know anything about the food industry, yeah. but I know from people I know that that's kind of the margin. Two to five percent would be high. But in prestige cosmetics, especially in skincare, um, your margin is probably going to be over 80 percent gross margin. And the yeah. reason it's high and you need it to be high. And I know when I say that many people who aren't aware of margin go, what? That's ridiculous. No, 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 no. Think big. If you're going to make a product, you're going to you're going to buy it from the contract manufacturer. You're going to make margins selling it to your first point of distribution. Let's say it's a salon. Yeah. They then need mm -hmm. to make margin to sell it to the consumer. So you're building back the margin from the retail price, right? However, if you now want mm -hmm. to export that product because you've got someone in Australia that wants to sell your product in Australia and represent you, you have to build in a distributor margin. Dermalogica is in 106 countries. We were international very fast because we had always recognized we were going to be an international business and we have to build in, build in the right margins to promote the business, to be able to do free sampling, to be able to make all this fabulous, you know, GWPs, the uniforms or whatever it is, you need enough margin. And again, I go into this in the book because it was nothing that we were taught. We learned it and we learned it the hard way. Yep. And sometimes it's the best way to learn things uh, yeah. as much pa as it's painful yeah. and, and hard yeah. uh, to do, especially at the, at the beginning. And then you learn from it. And then uh, yeah. you know, maybe things like this, like podcasts like this, allow people to maybe avoid them if you can yeah. with uh, listening to people that have done it before. That's right. Because, uh, you know, we're, we're willing to share our war stories because it really does, um, you know, we really want to see people not make the same mistakes as we did. And there's plenty but of, of course, and everything there's... is... 
sorry, and there's plenty of business for everyone. There's there's a space for exactly. everyone. There for everyone. I love that. Yes. There is. And that's the thing. Uh, but kind of like there's a couple of things I want to talk about before we start going to fire around and wrap it up is about um today. So you know you mentioned how you know you had a chemist and your contract manufacturing. Has that sort of evolved um, you know, uh, X years later? Is it is it sort of the same setup where you have your own in-house chemist and then a lab that you work with in California? Or, yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, you know, in 2015, Dermalogica was acquired by Unilever, which it was sort of like a beautiful arc to an incredible story. I'm still very involved with Dermalogica. I function as their chief visionary. I'm involved with the product development and the education and the yeah. marketing. And and I love it. And the reason I love it is because we share a common value system with Unilever. And, um, and if mm. I didn't feel that way, I wouldn't still be there. But Interestingly enough, unlike many of the big multinationals, Unilever did not come in and say, okay, we can manufacture this because we're yeah, Unilever, we're the second biggest uh, you know, multinational in cosmetics in the world. And we've got points of distribution and we don't – no, 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 no. They came in and Paul Pullman, who was then our CEO, and Alan Jope, who's our current CEO, came in and said, we – want we, your brand is beautiful we want to build a prestige division of brands and keep them intact you know how to mm. do this we know how to do mass we don't know this so on we still have our own team of chemists at Dermalogica headquarters in los angeles it's open for tours and visiting so come and say hello our head of our head of research and development is dr angela murphy she and i work very closely together that those formulas are run by us. We still use several um, local Southern California contract manufacturers. Some are pharmaceuticals because of our acne products and sunblocks and retinols, etc. Some are cosmetic for powders like daily microfolia. Um, we and then we use several of them, and every product is still made here in Southern California and shipped globally. And that way we have a Amazing. handle on the quality control. We test every single yeah. batch of every single product and nothing leaves yeah. our hands until we know it's right. So that's still intact. And do yeah. what the good news is we can lean on Unilever massive research and development with, you know, 65,000 PhDs working. When we have a challenge, we can now probably solve it in two months where it might have taken us four years mm. previously to find that exactly. knowledge yeah that's great yeah. that's like that story of scaling but with excellence and the right supporters by your side and it's really important to to before you go into bed with any strategic yes. you really ask and know the questions to to ask yes um to avoid a, a bad relationship because i've heard the stories too where it doesn't happen well from both the customers you know perspective yes. of like oh the quality has changed yes. the pricing has changed or the founder as well, because yes. it's still your baby at the end of the day yeah. that you want to protect and nurture, exactly. um, especially if you're still involved. So yes. that's amazing. And then you, you talked about, uh, you know, shipping globally. What is the current like distribution um, mix right now? Uh, and anyone listening that, are, you know, have lived under a rock and never tried Dermalogica, <laughs> if they haven't, where can they find it? You know, like, yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, listen, the whole world has changed, hasn't it, since the 1980s? That was literally the last yeah. century. And so the consumers changed too. And I believe in needing exactly to meet the consumer where they are. And uh, and so we met the consumer in the salon. They weren't being catered to. So we're still very strong in salon and uh, we're the number one product in professional salon because never forget, we have this whole suite of products that are only available to someone working in a salon who is licensed yeah. to work on the skin. So that's a whole other yeah. party going on at Dermalogica. Then we also have our retail um Piece, which is Sephora, Ulta, you'll find us in those stores and you'll find us in those stores with qualified skin therapists who are going to advise you on your skin, face map your skin and recommend the product correctly. Then we also have online, which is big. We have some third party online. We also have Dermalogica.com where you can get free advice, you can get samples, you can face map you know, with a professional. We do a ton of stuff virtually. So you can talk to a professional yeah. skin therapist like we're talking now and we can have a conversation about your skin and analyze your skin through video and and design a product regimen for you because every skin is completely unique, just like your fingerprints. Yeah. And then we have distributors in, in some countries, which are markets that 
because of language and culture uh, and regulations, they do a much better job than we would ever do. And then we own our own distribution in some countries, Canada, the UK, Germany, Italy, France, our joint distribution in Scandinavia and South Africa. We own the American market, the Canadian market and the Australian market. And we work with really great distributors in the other 106 countries. So it's very much um, a, a kind of a quilt uh, or what we call it, mm. a string of pearls, uh, each one standing separately on the string. Uh, but each one equally beautiful and important. That's uh, so beautifully said. Uh, and it's, it's really great to see um, that kind of love and heart gone through that kind of global expansion, yeah. um, especially as a, as a young brand who's on that journey now. It's like sort of like I want to protect that as I scale. Um, and, and do it with excellence. Yeah, and when you too fast, when you're you know? looking, yeah. yes, don't go too fast. And one one piece of advice I would say, Akash, to anyone looking internationally. After you've hmm. talked, we've talked margin and we've talked, you're owning your formulas and controlling your manufacturing. But the other thing is I never will do any kind of business with someone I don't want to have dinner with. Hmm. So exactly, you can find that. yourself opposite people who will offer you, you know, a big check and get your product and you would never want to have dinner with them. It's the wrong decision because yeah. it's coming down to a value system not just value, mm. but a values system so that it, do they have the same value system as you do? Because if they don't, whether it's around honesty, credibility, truthfulness, you'll never build trust. And if you don't build trust, you don't really have a profitable partnership. I love that. That's really great advice. And I'll, I'll I'm going to keep that in mind as well as I go through any stakeholder in Please. the next journey ahead. <laughs> just, yeah. you know, even if it's a even you know, obviously hiring someone, even like an agency, sure. a freelancer, right? Like sure. if you, yeah, it's any person, you've got to feel yeah. like the part of this tribe that you're building. Good, exactly. that word, I love it. Um, so in terms of uh, future of Dermalogica, yeah. um, I think, you know, a big, big part I can imagine would be navigating this whole new wave of consumers, mm -hmm. uh, especially the, the younger generations, mm -hmm. the generations to come. Mm -hmm. and, but what is sort of, um, yeah, on the horizon for you guys? Always growth. Um, you know, there's there's always new consumers, and the, we the millennials now outnumber the boomers. I'm a boomer, and my yeah. my eldest child is 29, and they always say, you know, okay, boomer. Well, <laughs> I'll say something. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll say, okay, millennial, because I have a Gen Z yeah. who uh, Lucy, who's oh, you have a Gen Z, 24, right, yeah. Yeah. and uh, and now we've got you know Gen Alpha coming up. Yeah. The great news about all of that is. And I see the difference even between my 29 and my 24-year-old. The Gen Z and, and now next gen um, are all digital yeah. natives, which is fantastic yeah. because more comfortable yeah. probably on a, on a laptop or on a phone than they are in, in a yeah. conversation and, you know, one-on-one -on -one in, a, in a room. So yeah. we have to accelerate that. We have to use that yeah. capital, that new capital. We've got AI literally right on our shoulder the, our lives are going to change within the next six months due to that. And, yep. and we have to emphasize the need for human connection and empathy because according to our Surgeon General in the US, and he's right, we have an epidemic of loneliness and disconnection, which is the equal and opposite reaction to how electronically connected we are. So we're looking at this whole piece mm. of human connection, human touch, literal eye contact, touch contact, skin contact, how important everyone who's offering anything in that arena is going to be. And that, of course, ground zero for us is that skin therapist. Who else is touching us anywhere like someone who's giving our massages, our skin treatments, our hair treatments? Our industry is exploding and will continue to do so. And we're also ready to meet the consumer in, in other channels, such as you know the medical arena, and the huge explosion of med spas here in the US, everyone's looking at that. We're very comfortable in that arena. We've already worked with dermatologists for many, many years. So it's exciting. I have to say the future is bright, the future is big, and I could not be more excited at the explosion of skincare because I felt like a voice in the wilderness when I would go yeah. and have, you know, meet and greets with editors and I'd be having my skincare products in my little box and they'd be saying, well, you know, we're really focusing on lipstick this week or, you know, now it's skin and I could not be more thrilled and I'm very proud to have played at least a small part in making that happen. 
a, a big part for sure and, <laughs> and it's just so exciting and uh, you know like um we're gonna go to, to fire round questions now but there's so much more to and you know maybe a, there'll be a part two along the the journey later on but for now at least people can read your book and i think that's i'm gonna put the link in the in the bio Thank so they can you. continue to hear about and you know obviously all these incredible articles online about all your achievements and, and accolades but um just want to say uh that there's a whole other piece that we haven't gone into with your work that you've done and i've touched upon it in in the beginning you know with with women and united yeah, let's, nations and, let's let's but, do that for yeah. for another podcast about the importance another, of empowering skill set and women exactly and i would love to talk there's an there's some incredible work coming out of india i want to talk about too because that wow. is happening with the empowerment of women and with this, the digital code that everyone has, 99.9% .9 of the population are linked on where they can deposit money, transfer money, open a bank account virtually. And that mechanism for training is going to be huge for women. That's another podcast. Okay, well, I, I have some ideas or for, for something on this. So let's, uh, let's, we'll talk offline Perfect. about that, but 100%, we need, we need to work on that. Yeah. Um, so Fire round questions, but before I do, I have a desert island situation. So okay. you know what's coming. I'm being very strict and you can only bring one product to this island from Dermalogica. What is your go-to that you're going to be bringing with you? I'm thinking the Inner Hebrides of Scotland because I have family that live on the Isle of Mull. I'm taking special cleansing yes. gel. The reason is okay. it's a foaming cleanser. It'll clean my skin. I could wash my hair with it. I could wash my body. And at a pinch, you can wash your underwear in a hotel sink and I've done it. Love that. That's a great, that's a great even hack in a little, like a top tip. Yeah. So, uh, with products, I love yeah, that. Totally so product that just doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> that's the reason why it's one of your hero skews that <laughs> exactly. have just become still one of the best sellers today. Mm -hmm. That's why. Mm -hmm. Um, so fire around to the top kind of first of mine, what comes to your head? Uh, first question yeah. is what's another beauty brand? any vertical that you're currently loving right now i'm loving a brand called osea osea it's a yeah. body line and skincare i think it's like a sleeping giant i especially yeah. love their body oil i mix it in with our body mm. hydrating cream i think it's a beautiful little brand and i've got my eye on it amazing uh love the packaging of osea yeah, too. such yeah. a beautiful logo yeah gorgeous so um Second question is, what or where is your happy place? Oh, my happy place is um, on Lake Como in Italy. Amazing. Oh, take me there right now. <laughs> We're both in our gray skies of, of weird moments of yeah. summer, which is not summer. Yeah. But yeah, and I know I, what you the mean. the quiet side <laughs> of Lake Como. Como, not the crazy paparazzis yeah. at the quiet. Not the party. No, no, party. no, not the party the side, the quiet no. side, the quiet no, no. side. Love that. Yeah. My next question is, do you have a hidden talent that you can share with us that tell us about? I do have, I think I have a few, but I think one of my main ones is I really love to tackle home repairs. I just fixed our dishwasher. No yeah, I, I like fixing things. I like fixing, if I can I fix that. it myself, I'll do it myself. And it's like that engineering puzzles yeah. kind of side of you where yeah. it's like, I got to solve that. You yeah. Know? And it's, I love there's that. Nothing you it's kind of like what entrepreneurs do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like problem way. solving. And there's nothing you can't find yeah. on YouTube. It's fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. Or TikTok. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Or TikTok. I was about to say, or TikTok, which yeah. is kind of scary, but that's kind of like even a quicker way. Just be like, you know, now we find ourselves on YouTube with a 10 minute video being like, <laughs> just speed up, get to the point. It's, true. it's too I'm long. Like, Where's the unplug in the drain? <laughs> Quick. <laughs> exactly. Um, my next question is Do you have a favorite quote or like a saying? Yes, Oscar Wilde. And, and just to tell everyone, I did not know these questions were coming. So, but I, 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 know. I'm, I, I I'm, know. You're, you're the best answer so far. Really? You have no time. You're answering them. Yeah, like everyone is like, like either two minute answers or like can i have a moment and i'm like oh no I feel like, did i send you these questions no you, you're amazing I, no but i love this see i, I love competitive as you can probably tell uh, my I favorite quote is by oscar wilde and it's be yourself everyone else is taken love that now my, my, my last question is if you weren't a beauty entrepreneur or in the beauty industry what would jane be doing right now Jane would be working in the area of um, estate jewelry. I would be focusing on Georgian jewelry, which is period from, yeah. you know, 1700s to the early 1800s. 
and particularly the mourning jewelry, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, called Memento Mori. I love Georgian jewelry wow. and I seek it out and wear it and I would love to evaluate it, specialize in it. I don't know, work at Sotheby's doing it or having yeah. my own store. Well, I asked that question to remind yourself that, you know, you can always explore this and uh, that's a great one. I'm going to check that out later as well, <laughs> Georgian Jewelry. But yes. well, thank you so much, oh, Jane, for thanks, sharing your wisdom and your story. I mean, there's part two coming and a lot more things that we're going to be able to do together. I'm excited for what's ahead. I but for everyone listening, uh, where can they continue to follow you um, and, of course, Dermalogica, the brand? Oh, well, definitely Dermalogica is on Instagram, Dermalogica, and uh, on, on um, Dermalogica.com. Uh, I'm on yeah. Instagram, uh, Jane Werwand, and uh, I do fun little things about my life and, and throw in the odd skincare tip here and there and um, talk okay. about what I'm up to and, and what I'm doing in, in the nonprofit spaces and what I'm doing to empower local entrepreneurs and women. So um, that's it. Oh, I'll put all the links and the, the book as well in the, in the bio. So Fantastic. Just tap straight away. Great. And uh, looking forward to hopefully meet in person very soon and continue our conversation. This is it. just the beginning. Thanks, Akash. <laughs>